Hi, my name is Joe Reeves. Welcome to the Thwack Camp session Visibility in the Data Center. I'm the product manager for SolarWinds NetFlow Traffic Analyzer, and we'll be talking today about how to understand traffic flows within our data center. Yeah, and I'm Kevin Sparenberg, Technical Content Manager and Thwack MVP. So why are we still talking about data centers? This is a question everyone's asking. Isn't everyone moving to the public cloud? Why do I need to know about traffic within my data center? So understanding how our data center workloads communicate is an, is an important part of deciding how we group them together and where we provision them in the first place. It's also important as we consider how we move virtual machines around to different hosts uh, within the data center so that we are most efficiently using our hardware resources. But, but that's counterintuitive. That's the idea behind virtual machines. I can move them among hosts and it doesn't matter. There's no negative ramifications, right? Just moving a single VM from a host can essentially drag network traffic out onto our physical switch fabric as that virtual machine communicates with other machines that we left behind. So understanding the traffic between machines can give us some insights into when we might want to move them as a group or consolidate machines that are talking across an entire data center today. Okay, so let me get this straight. It's not we're talking about what's happening like right now, right this second, but things we may need to know when we're ready to move, whether we're going to a private cloud or a public cloud or a colo or any other solutions, right? Exactly. All right. So Flow Traffic Insights can help us as we begin to migrate or split workloads into public cloud environments. Uh, traffic analysis can also help us understand dependencies on services that may not be obvious. So those could include things like name resolution, NTP, private directory services, or integrations with other custom homegrown applications that could introduce really large latencies if we're not careful. Okay, so you and I, separate from this, spoke about a scenario we both ran into in previous lives. At previous jobs, we actually moved physical exchange servers from one location to another. Now, we know that requires authentication. We know it has to talk to Active Directory, but we didn't realize how much it has to talk to Active Directory. So the entire service is just dropped to a crawl until we realize, oh, we moved an exchange server, we got to move an AD server over there with it so it can handle low latency authentication. That was a painful lesson for both of us and it took some time to resolve. Uh, visualizing traffic patterns could also help us confirm that we're correctly segmenting our traffic and maintaining separation for security and guiding our traffic through yeah. the appropriate firewalls or load balancers. We can also observe these devices are actually behaving correctly uh, as we intended when we first configured them. Yeah, a lot of that is important. Now, while I'm here and I can ask Joe questions directly, let's remind our viewers that they can type questions in the live chat over yonder during the session. And with that, let's address some of the challenges we face collecting this kind of data within our data center. All right, so let's talk about the different dimensions of data flowing into and out of the data center and also uh, flowing within the data center. Yeah. Now. I didn't understand this. I will be completely honest with everyone there, and maybe a lot of the people there are in similar situations I was. When I thought, thought NetFlow, it was from my edge routers, because that was what connected to my MPLS networks, or my point-to-point -point networks, or my internet. And if that's the case, great, but that's the stuff I pay for every single month. The stuff behind that, like my infrastructure, my, my fabric, those are sunk costs. I bought them once, maybe I'm paying maintenance, granted but the cabling's done, the power is done, all of that stuff, I don't really care, or I didn't care, mm -hmm. about the information that went that way. So you came to me and we were discussing this session and I was like, does it really matter? Do I care about that? And then you gave me this laundry list of reasons. I was like, yeah, I should probably pay attention. There is uh, definitely a consideration for how we efficiently use um, those resources within the data center. So how we group our workloads together, how we move our workloads around, um, and how we make the best use of those sunk costs that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But there's kind of two dimensions here uh, that we're looking at. The north-south dimension of traffic uh, that we're looking at uh, going into and out of the data center. That's traffic that is um, lower volume traffic, it's traffic we may want uh, higher granularity of information okay. uh, around. Um, and it's traffic uh, between resources in our data center and public internet, uh, perhaps other data center locations around the world uh, that are part of our enterprise or business unit, um, and may also be um, a path for client traffic to enter public facing resources inside our data center. Okay, so, but we've classified that as north-south. So that's, that's this way. Right. But we're talking about visibility within the data center, so that's this way. 
So we, on here, we've called that east-west. Uh, so that's the layer two switching and basically below. Exactly. So it's pretty straightforward to get uh, information on the north-south traffic, uh, traffic flowing into and, and out of the data center. It's a lot more challenging, though, to get information on that traffic um, within the data center and the insights that we need to be able to decide how to group our workloads together or um, how to make the best use of the hardware and storage that we've already uh, placed inside the data center. Yeah, I mean, if we just talk logistics, your edge router, a lot of them typically have, what, two interfaces, an inside and an outside, so you got to set up flow traffic on one or the other, mm -hmm. and you're done. But when you're talking switching and routing and pure layer two switching layers, that's a lot more interfaces and the VLANs and you know the virtual domains and all these other kinds of things that could come with that. So kind of, kind of having a good plan from jump seems to be the wisest way to proceed with something like this. Yeah, the nature of the traffic is uh, very different. It's very um, high volume traffic. Um, it's uh, a lot more diverse in terms of the number of conversations. Um, and it's, uh, uh, it's just a higher volume of flow records that we need to collect to get the kind of insights that we need. If we talk virtual clusters, we've got a couple of nodes, two, three nodes, they're constantly sharing information back and forth. That's going to be showing up here. Mm -hmm. If you've got the client computers talking to elements in there, that's traffic. You're going to see some of that in here. If you've got just pure replication for data syncing, you're going to have some of that in here. So you're seeing everything that's going on within kind of the big dot, I think we made the joke. It's right, like, right. if you actually look at just north-south traffic, then your data center is a big dot, and you're looking at stuff coming in and coming out. And what we're actually allowing you to do by actually looking at east-west traffic is actually going into that and exploding it. So it's kind of more like, instead of being a dot, it's more like an interstate coming down, and then all the branches going in and out of the city. Right, right. We have this notion of um, affinity of workloads. That is basically how workloads sort of hang together, how they talk to each other. Um, and how they should be uh, grouped together or moved together. And this becomes important when we start to think about um, strategies like hybrid cloud, where we're taking uh, maybe part of a workload uh, and moving that into a public cloud environment, but we want to retain some control of the traffic inside of our data center. Yeah, well, even if we take that one and we talked about like moving a VM from one location to another within your data center, if you take that same VM and let's say it's a web server, and you move that to public cloud, and you're like, it's just a web server, nothing bad's going to happen. Well, what happens if it has to make calls back for authentication? Yeah. What happens if it ha has to make calls back for databasing? All these things, instead of having a latency of near nil when it was on your local network, now you've introduced this latency and possibly packet loss. Right. Is it robust enough to handle it? Does it pre-cache any of this stuff? I mean, you can really well, we'll just say it outright. You can really, really mess your stuff up if you move it kind of haphazardly. Right. So you have to know what's happening on these layers. There's this notion of a traffic footprint around our application architectures. And that includes not only the communication between the elements of the architecture, but also all of those dependencies, like the one that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. So um, the other place where I have seen uh, the, the relevance of this kind of analysis has to do with acquisitions and divestitures. And a lot of folks are trying to deal with bringing new companies in or um, divesting parts of their business units out. So as you bring in new elements of traffic, you're actually transitioning some of these dependencies from one company infrastructure to the other. Um, so being able to do that kind of analysis ahead of time and understand um, how those dependencies are going to move critically important to being able to maintain some kind of continuity uh, in service as you make those kinds of transitions. So if we're talking, this is the merger and acquisitions world. Sorry, mm -hmm. I came from legal, so right, right. it's uh, mergers and acquisitions. But if we already know this information about our organization, and then we're going to grab another small company and make it a part of ours, or the reverse, split it off, if we already know what's happening with us, then we only need to understand this little bit and how it's going to affect the rest of our organization. Right, right. Seems to ease a lot of that then. Yeah, this example with Exchange Service, for example, came up with uh, a, a large divestiture where we started to move portions of the infrastructure but didn't understand what was going on in the back end. So the real challenge is um, where do we go in the data center to be able to find this kind of information? Mm -hmm. how, do we, uh, how do we break that down and figure out um, where we can look to get different types of information for that north-south traffic uh, versus the traffic between workloads that's going on inside the data center. So there's basically uh, two mechanisms that we have 
that are available to us to be able to collect flow data. And the first mechanism uh, is what we would call a flow export mechanism. Now, uh, that includes technologies like NetFlow or IPFix or JFlow. Um, and as you can see in, uh, in this uh, uh, animation, flow export um, basically takes data that is flowing through a device, it constructs a flow table on the device, and then periodically flushes or exports that data out to a collector. That's one we're mostly familiar with. Yeah, yeah that's the north-south. I wanna watch everything that goes through my firewall, and I want you to take all the information that's part of that, give me kind of a little summary of what's happened over the last 60 seconds, two minutes, whatever it happens to be, and ship that over to a collector that then churns through that data. Right. Now, there are some pros and cons here. So um, one of the uh, advantages, as you mentioned, is that you see everything that's going through that particular device. It's uh, promiscuous monitoring. It shows us everything uh, that's flowing through the device, summarizes that, and makes it available to the collector. But one of the downsides is that it's very resource intensive for the device and for the network. And we talked to an MVP not too long ago that talked, uh, oh, talked yeah. to us about uh, some of the overhead that's associated with characterizing traffic. Um, I think he was saying something like 25% of his device. Uh, it was 25% and additional 25%. It was 25% just turning flow on for everything with all of the kind of various characteristics. Right. And then another 25% for application recognition on top of that. Which, if you've got something that's running like 10% nominally, you could probably handle this, but it's not a good idea to put unnecessary load on your infrastructure. And if you miss one of those uh, flow uh, exports, then you're gonna miss a significant uh, volume of traffic, oh, a yeah. significant uh, piece of the puzzle that's, uh, that's important to understand the traffic flowing through that device. Okay, so let me get this straight. The great things about watching the North-South is you get every record. Mm -hmm. And the bad thing about watching North South is you get every record. Exactly. Okay, right. I wanted to make sure I got that clear. Right. It, it's, it's, right. it's resource intensive on the sender and the receiver. If you have to have to have to have everything though, this is the kind of monitoring you gotta do. Exactly. Right. Now there's, uh, there's another monitoring technology that we can use that's better suited for these high volume, high speed, very diverse environments inside the data center. So um, as you can see in, uh, in this animation, um, we're talking about traffic sampling. Uh, and in traffic sampling, the device uh, interfaces actually take um, samples, one in N of every packets that the interface sees, and they forward those uh, immediately to the collector. So that's a, a form of uh, continuous streaming telemetry, mm -hmm. and it's been available to us now for, uh, for quite some time. Okay, now I'll be completely honest, I don't know S-Flow. Like I said, I was more concerned about my north-south, I cared about my WAN interfaces, S-Flow wasn't going to work for that mm -hmm. because sampling is not what I wanted. I needed to understand everything going in and out. Right. Sampling, it seems like we're kind of skipping a lot though. I mean, if you say one in N, what's that N? Is it one in two? Yeah. Is it one in five? Is it one in a thousand, 10,000, a million? And I guess that pr probably depends on how much traffic you actually are dealing with, how many packets are actually coming across at a time. But what's the deal with sampling? Sampling is just a very, very small portion of the traffic through a device, and you can't possibly be accurate with that. We would only see a tiny fraction of all that traffic. So packet sampling and statistical estimation of traffic has been around for several decades. And it's a proven method to give us a really broad and scalable view of the traffic across the switching fabric. Okay, now I'm not following, so how does it work? So samples are collected randomly by the switch, usually in the switch uh, ASIC hardware, okay. and forwarded onto a collector. A statistical model is constructed that estimates the different kinds of traffic and the traffic volumes based on the sample data. So in the uh, equation on the left here, uh, we're estimating the different classes of traffic based on the number of samples that are randomly selected. Okay, but if we're only sampling one in 2,000 or so packets, just to pick a number, how can that possibly be accurate? So the proportions of traffic that show up in our samples are representative of the proportions in the larger traffic mix. The cool thing about this method is that we can actually calculate how accurate our estimation is based on the number of samples we receive. Okay, uh, in my head that doesn't make sense though, because I would think the accuracy would depend on how much of the total traffic we see, not just how many samples we get. And intuitively, that's how we think about it, right? But mathematically, our accuracy is based on the number of samples we see. 
And over time, as we see more samples, our error rate declines for a given confidence interval. Okay, now I like math. I can follow all of it, but I don't like statistics. So what is exactly is the confidence interval? So that's basically the range or the variance of our estimate where we can be confident that our calculated values m make, uh, match the exact mix and volume of the traffic. Okay, but uh, again, that sounds suspicious, suspiciously like voodoo or something else in that arena. So there's, uh, there are other places we use the same technique in okay. a more familiar setting. So for example, if I want to know how people in Texas are going to vote in the next election, I don't have to talk to over half of them personally, right? No, no, you'd have to talk to all of them to know how they're going to vote in the next election. Which is really not practical. Well. So I estimate how they will vote by selecting a subset of them randomly and asking them. Okay, so this is kind of, uh, this is exit polling, but for switches. Exactly. So we have that same problem of scale in a data center switching fabric. We can't practically examine every single packet that moves through our data center without building another data center to monitor the first data center. So if we actually have NetFlow turned on pure exporting, we're talking so much traffic that we just have to build an entire separate data center just to crunch through that traffic. Yeah. Okay. But it, it sounds kind of complex to figure out. So how do I make sure I'm getting the right number of samples here? So we have a spreadsheet to help you estimate your sample arrival rates and volumes, and we've posted this on THWAC. And we'll put that link in the resources for this session. There's also some really good rule of thumb estimates and some additional resources to help understand packet sampling available on the sflow.org site. And a link to that will be in the resources as well. Okay, great. So there's a couple of places inside the data center fabric where we can get um, accurate information both about what's going on north-south and what's going on in our east-west traffic. Okay. Now, now, this I like. This I recognize. This makes sense to me. Right, right. So the, the first of these that we'll look at is uh, the configuration for a Nexus 7K switch, which is a hybrid layer 2, layer 3 device. Okay. Now, this config that we're showing is for the 7K. This doesn't mean that there aren't other devices out there that support Flow. If you're not using Cisco as your infrastructure, if you're using an, one of the other vendors, Juniper or uh, HPE, any of the other vendors, you have a similar type of configuration available to you, correct? That's right. Okay, yeah. good. So for the, uh, for the 7K, uh, when we look at um, north-south traffic, it's uh, fairly straightforward to get uh, layer three net flow uh, out of the device. And so what we're showing you here is a fragment of the configuration of the 7K. And we'll start by uh, setting up the kind of flow record that we want to see. And you can see here that this is uh, a layer three uh, flow record. Yeah. Now I'm used to seeing, let's see, one, two, three. The first three blocks and part of the last block make perfect sense to me. These look exactly like the ones I put on my routers. Mm -hmm. Define a record which basically says what I want to collect, mm -hmm. define an exporter, which is where I want to send it and how I want to send it, and then figuring out you know, my monitor, what goes into my monitor. Well, the record goes into the monitor, and then just letting it go. And there's some settings you can change in there, obviously, but this is kind of like the most simple. This is the bare bones config for sending stuff to a NetFlow receiver. Right. Now, in the case of the 7K, we also have uh, an option of being able to attach or index on uh, layer two uh, flow records. So we could actually uh, add a set of extensions for layer two traffic uh, that include uh, source and destination uh, MAC address, for example. We've talked to some customers um, who have set that up and, uh, and have tried exporting layer two records out of their 7K switch. And the last customer that I talked to um, was exporting traffic volumes and getting a very accurate, complete picture of all of the traffic through uh, the 7K, but they were seeing something like 3 million flows per minute. <laughs> okay, huh. mathing hard. Uh, 3 million flows per minute for one 7K. For one 7K, that's right. How many people only have one? Normally, you, yeah. they're, they're, I'm not gonna say they're always in pairs, but frequently they're in pairs. 3 million, at least doubled, and that's per minute. Whatever you're sending that to has got to be a beast of a machine to even try to keep up. It does. The 7Ks are usually uh, architected uh, as spine switches. So you're not just going to have one. Yeah. And it's a significant challenge then to be able to promiscuously monitor layer two out of the 7Ks. Um, if you're monitoring layer three uh, only though, you've got another option in terms of this additional configuration block that we're showing for sampling. 
Okay. And that for me is these last two blocks. We've got the NetFlow sampler and the assigning it to a sampler. Now NetFlow sampler, this is simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like build a sampler, give it a name, probably optional, mm -hmm. uh, and then tell it how you want to do the moding. And here it's a one out of 2,000, which we mentioned earlier. But if this is too aggressive or not aggressive enough, you could probably say one out of 10,000 or 20,000 if you've got an ex exceptionally busy fabric. But this last line on the configuration or the interface configuration is the one that threw me. Because I'm like, this looks really close. And then you just say at the end, sampler, NetFlow sampler. Right. So when you uh, assign your monitor, and you'll assign your monitor in an interface context on an interface by interface basis, when you assign your monitor, you'll add the sampler that's associated with that monitor, and uh, you'll sample. Uh, frames out of that particular interface. So you can actually have multiple NetFlow samplers. Like, let's say this one is for your, one out of 2,000 is for your server VLAN, mm -hmm. or your server switching, and that's what I want. But then you've got other ones that are for DMZ or client, and you want slightly more aggressive or less aggressive. You could actually set up another sampler mm -hmm. and just change the very end portion of the interface config line. And I may not want a sample going northbound at all. I may want to get all of those records completely. But I can tune the sampling rate based on what I'm connected to underneath, yeah. OK. So this, the out of 2,000, will give you a relatively accurate, within a 95% roughly, confidence interval that you actually understand everything going through here is this. The nature of the traffic that we're trying to characterize, um, that traffic that's flowing within uh, the data center, means that we need a very broad view, but not uh, a view that is granular down to an individual conversation level. And I think this is where a lot of people um, have reservations about sampling. Um, if you're sampling, you are not going to see 100% of the traffic, and you're not going to see uh, a granularity that extends all the way down to individual conversations. Yeah, and that's kind of what I'm, I hate to say it this way, but that's kind of what I want. I want to know the individual, but really within your data center, you don't care about necessarily the, end, the individual endpoints. You more care about kind of the class of traffic that's moving along the fabric, like this is exchange replication, or this is this kind of thing. Maybe I don't necessarily care all of the detail level, but I need to understand it. And from what you said earlier, the more of the samples I get, the more accurate I understand everything. It's not necessarily that I pump 30, what was it, 30 million rows? Right. It's not necessarily that I pump 30 million records into something. It's that I have enough slices in time to, be able to like hold them up and look at them and say, this is actually what I'm getting. You're trying to make decisions about um, how, to, uh, how to rearrange workloads, how to architect for replication, for example, um, or how to group workloads together. So you're not trying to necessarily do troubleshooting on an individual conversation basis. OK, so this is different and configured differently and spoken about differently than the North-South. The North-South is, hey, I got, you know, Joe happens to be on YouTube all day long. I can find that with the North-South, but I don't need that within my data center. Right. I need to understand how my workloads work together so I can plan for today, tomorrow, and however far out you're actually able to do so. Yeah, it's really a cost-benefit equation, right? So uh, to be able to track every single flow uh, through your data center, as you mentioned earlier, requires a real beast of uh, a monitoring platform. Yeah. It's expensive, um, and it's time consuming to set up, and it's expensive to go back and retrieve the data and do analysis on it as well. I can't imagine going through 30 million records every minute and trying to figure out some type of summary on that. It, it's a ridiculous amount of content. It is. It really is. So let's talk about the uh, Cisco 9K. All right, so we get to play with the 9000 series. Exactly. Yay. So on the 9000 series, we've got uh, another option that's available to us. Uh, we can actually enable uh, S-Flow on the 9K, and we can get S-Flow samples from uh, each of the interfaces on the 9K. Every single interface? Every single interface. Awesome. So setting this up is pretty straightforward. Um, we'll enable the feature on the box. Um, we'll set up uh, a destination to send our uh, S-Flow data. Okay. We'll set up a source for our S-Flow data, which is the IP address uh, where the data is originating from. All right. Um, and then um, the uh, interface that that's associated with. And then we'll set up uh, our parameters around sampling. So our sampling rate, our sample size, 
Um, we can also collect counter poles. So in S-Flow, there are uh, sampled frames. There's also uh, counter samples that contain uh, interface metrics. Oh, okay. So we can receive those as well. Uh, and uh, a datagram size, a maximum datagram size. And then we want to be careful to remember uh, to save our configuration. Yeah, well, always be safe on that. So make right. sure you have a configuration management tool to make sure that when this is written, you've got a backup of it. Um, questions about the IPs in here, though. Mm -hmm. So the collector, in this case, 192.0.5, that's, that's our target. Mm -hmm. That's from this 9K, we're sending traffic information to that device, and that device is kind of crunching the numbers. That's right. Okay, but the 192.0.2.3, is this like the management IP of the 9K so that we actually can understand when it comes in from the 9K? It's this kind of thing? Yeah, that actually helps us figure out um, our interface indexes and uh, the source of information uh, from the flow data that we're receiving. So this is basically a source that we can track in our flow collector to understand where this data is coming from and what kind of interfaces it has. Okay, because this configuration, unlike the one for a router, is not assigned to an interface. Right. So we need to have some kind of way to backtrack and say it's from this device doing this kind of work. Exactly. Okay, that makes a lot of sense considering this was something that was very, very difficult for me to wrap my head around in general because I'm like, it's, it doesn't really go from a single interface configuration. Right. Where do I put it? I don't know what to do. But this kind of makes sense. Right. It also seems to be a slightly smaller config, which is also nicer. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a little more straightforward to, to be able to set this up and to get it going. Uh, on your 9K. Now, some of the folks that have set this up, uh, some of the challenges that they've encountered have to do with um, how to get the data off the switch and onto the collector. So what VRF to send this out, yeah. right? Uh, and then decisions about how to source it so that their collector actually understands um, the interface indexes. Yeah, and for this one, we're only using for the data source, we only have eight interfaces we're using. Maybe you don't need all of those. Maybe you need 10 times as many. The 9K is not exactly a small machine. Right, right. But, you know, you could, in theory, if you wanted to do it, send these out to potentially different traffic, send them through some type of aggregator or something like that before it gets for analysis. But if you're looking at traffic, and the way my mind is going with this is, if we want to start within our data center and just worry about our virtual infrastructure, then I would put all the inter Ethernet interfaces on there for all of the management mm -hmm. of those, the kind of public side IPs for all my virtual machines, right. the replication mm -hmm. subnets and things like that. And if I could watch those, then I would get an understanding of kind of how that holistic environment was working and could give me better understanding and where I could go for the future. Right. Now the big advantage with SFL obviously is that it's going to be lighter weight on the device, lower overhead on the device, and also lower overhead uh, on the network. Okay. So your collector is not working as hard. Your network fabric itself is not sending as much content, and the device itself is not working as hard to actually collect this and summarize this information. Right. So that's cheaper, better, faster. Absolutely. Okay, good. And with the position of the 9K uh, in the topology, you're getting a really good um, view, good visibility of what's going on out at the edge uh, of your data center network. Oh, great. So let's take a look at uh, a final example here. And that's uh, a distributed vSwitch. So um, to gain some insight into what's going on inside your hypervisor, there are a couple of options, right? Mm -hmm. So one of those options is uh, the VMware distributed vSwitch, but there are some other options as well. Yeah, if you're talking VMware, uh, Cisco has the 1000V. There's similar solutions for um, Hyper-V. I don't know off the top of my head, but I think the 1000V can also be used in that scenario. So there's all kinds of switching options you can do inside of the hypervisor. Mm -hmm. But when we talked about this, the very first thing you said is IP fix. IP fix, IP fix, and this, and IP fix. And, and I remember going into my lab and going, I am right clicking everything, and I am not finding IP fix <laughs> anywhere. So the way that uh, VMware presents uh, for their distributed vSwitch, they mm -hmm. present this uh, kind of generically as NetFlow information. It's actually going to export IP fix data. Okay, so they call it NetFlow, and it's probably for, for, so it's recognizable. All right, so IP fix, in this instance, IP fix equals NetFlow, but it's yeah. a language thing. It's not actually a, the construct of data coming out. Exactly. Okay. So um, 
at the time that the IP fix standard was being developed, um, there was a lot of discussion in the IETF working group of, and a lot of influence from uh, Cisco's version 9. The two are very closely related to each other, but they're not the same standard. They are very distinct. Yeah, because I'm looking at just the sample here and one, two, third option, observation domain ID. Yeah. I'm, Zero looks fine to me because I have no idea what to put there. <laughs> it's a zero or a null. That's what goes there as far as right. I'm concerned. That observation domain ID is really a unique construct to IPFIX. It's very similar to an engine ID in NetFlow or oh, something all right. like that. So okay. this is actually really straightforward to set up. Um, uh, in, the, uh, in the vCenter user interface, you can go in and uh, set up uh, the collector IP address. Again, where am I going to send uh, my IPFIX data? Uh, the collector port where my collector's listening for that data, um, the IP address of the source switch. All right. Now, if I leave that blank, that winds up being um, the IP addresses of each of the hypervisors that the uh, oh, switch port. extends uh, to cover. Right? Oh, okay. Or I can consolidate all of those in a single source IP address and I can send them. So if I'm actually working with a cluster, I perhaps want to have a single IP in here as opposed to getting three sets of traffic from my three nodes. They would all consolidate under one. Exactly. Okay. Now, um, one of the challenges here is going to be trying to map the uh, indexes for all of the data, for all of the interfaces that you're going to see. Yeah. That's challenging. That. That's something that uh, uh, at the, uh, at, for right now you're going to need to be able to do manually. Okay. Well, yeah, but I mean, if you have to do that manually once that you don't have to mess with it too often after that. Right. I mean, all of this, every single config we're showing, there's some type of manual configuration you're going to have to do. Yeah. Whether it's you know, clicking on a box, you could probably actually find a way to do this in some type of scripting language to speed it up. Mm -hmm. uh, we will not cover that right now, but it's something interesting to talk about. And if you have solutions for us, please let us know as well, because I, for one, don't like right-click, checkbox, OK, right-click, checkbox, OK, right-click, checkbox, OK. Not my favorite. No, no. Right. So. So the other parameter that you'll find here that's familiar is the sampling rate itself? Yeah, now here the sampling rate says 100. Mm -hmm. So from previous examples, we were using one in 2,000. Mm -hmm. Would that mean this needs to be 2,000? It really depends on the kind of traffic that you see, the traffic volumes that you yeah. see, the diversity of the conversations mm -hmm. that you see. But one of the other options that you'll notice here is whether or not you just want to process flows that are internal to the switch, that are being switched between ports, uh, on the switch, or whether you want to cover traffic that's going off the switch. Okay, well. so this is technically going on the fabric of the virtual infrastructure. If I say process internal only, it's only worried about virtual machine to virtual machine communications, right. and any other communications like that go from virtual machine to perhaps another cluster that somewhere else would go up through my regular switching fabric and would be captured by my 9K or my 7K or whatever infrastructure I have there. So you've got some choices about where you want to look and what kind of information you're going to see at each one of those collection points. So realistically, if I have gone a ton of virtualization, virtualization everywhere, I don't necessarily need to put a S-Flow on my physical swi switching fabric. I could just put it inside my hypervisors and get an understanding of how those all work together. You could, you could. Okay. If you have an all, uh, all hypervisor environment in your data center, and yeah. a lot of people do. Yeah. So let's cover uh, one more topic that's really important, which is how we characterize um, applications. We have a couple of options here. Um, one simple way uh, to characterize applications is to identify the groups of addresses and the kinds of protocols that we're communicating with over those addresses. Uh, a good example of that would be looking at the addresses that are associated with Amazon Web Services uh, availability zones. Those are all published. Those yeah. are all available. We would use those in our application definition. Okay, so we could put them into an IP group and at least that's one beginning of a characterization of traffic. So we could say everything to or from this group of IPs we know is hosted by AWS. And then, then since we kind of got the source slash destination done, then we can look at the individual ports. Right. So we can say, okay, well, 80 we know, 443 we probably know, mm -hmm. you know, but you know, 64327, we have no idea what that's used for. Right. Well, right. I do, but you know, okay. realistically, <laughs> you're probably not going to recognize that one. Right. So this is great, but that seems, again, a lot of kind of a little bit of manual process in there, but it also seems kind of necessary because it seems to be specific to your org. Right. 
you know, if, if literally I'm only hosting web out there, then I can just use 443 and 80, and ta-da, problem solved. Yeah, this type of uh, characterization, as you mentioned, works really well for legacy applications mm -hmm. or um, applications that are parked on custom ports uh, inside your organization. But it can also work for those services that publish a list of well-known addresses and the protocols that they use. So okay. other examples of that might be um, Netflix or, uh, uh, Yahoo or something like that. You could even go so far as to say something like uh, Amazon's RDS, their database instances, or uh, Microsoft Azure SQL databases. You could actually know that for if they're the Microsoft SQL variety, they're all in 1433. Mm -hmm. And they may be locked down only to your ports or your IPs at your organization so you can access it, but you'd still be able, since that's all flowing through all of this fabric, you could see what kind of communication is going back and forth there. Right. Okay. So as you mentioned, it's a multi-step process. You start by creating the IP groups that associate those endpoints, and then you uh, define the kinds of protocols that are going to go to and from those endpoints, and then characterize that as a particular type of application. You'll start to see that show up uh, in your collector. Now, realistically, if we're talking cloud type solutions, most of this should be TCP, right? Mm -hmm. That's okay. right. All right. Just, right. just wanted for clarification purposes. Sometimes uh, you may be looking at UDP traffic. Though. I can see that for voice and video mm -hmm. streaming type yeah. stuff. That does make sense. I know there's some people that have actually actually off lifted and shifted all of their voice com, their VoIP solutions mm -hmm. to a cloud solution. Mm -hmm. So I expect some UDP traffic, but I'm thinking of pr primarily we're talking TCP most of the time. That's probably true. Yeah. yeah. So um, there are some other al alternatives as well. So. Um, the Cisco gear includes um, a technology called NBAR. Okay. So um, NBAR ships definitions of applications, um, and that traffic is actually characterized, again, on the box before those flow records are exported out to your collector. And NBAR is also extensible. That's right. You can actually download from Cisco's website additional definitions, put them on the gear, and then I'll just kind of absorb these definition files and says, oh, this is a new type of traffic that we didn't recognize before, mm -hmm. and now we're going to classify it as this. Right. So it's really sort of a, uh, uh, a living definition that evolves over time. Cisco can update that. Um, you could import that into your device and get a more accurate or up-to-date characterization of uh, different types of applications as they change over time. Yeah, but that also means that's potentially additional load on that device doing that characterization. So it really is a balancing act. It is. It's determining what's going to be best for your environment, mm -hmm. how, much, how much level of granularity you need for everything, and determining you know, where you can you know, stress hardware and if it's worth that kind of offset. That's right. So NBAR makes sense probably out at the edge of that north-south mm -hmm. traffic. Yeah. Right. Because the volume's not as high. Right. It's very specific, and that's the stuff you more, more need to necessarily worry about because mm -hmm. it potentially is leaving your network and your protected zones. Yeah. So one of the practical applications for this type of characterization that I've seen is um, the detection of shadow IT. So in organizations where business units may be placing workloads out into public cloud services, and IT may not know about it. Um, being able to characterize the traffic that's flowing out there um, gives you some insight into um, shadow IT operations, allows you to make contact with those business units and uh, negotiate with them. But none of our, none of the people watching this, none of them have encountered a business unit that just got, you know, a little too much of themselves and said, we're going to buy some cloud this no. and we're going to go put it out there and then IT won't be our problem anymore, right? No. That's never happened? That never happens. Of course that not. That never happens. All right. So in this THWAC camp session, we've talked about a variety of different sources of flow data mm -hmm. inside our data center. We've talked about some different approaches that uh, popular core data center switches take to provide flow instrumentation. All right. We've talked about different major flow directions into and out of the data center and among workloads within the data center. Mm -hmm. We covered hybrid cloud traffic and one way to get better visibility into a virtualized environment. Yeah. So we've covered a broad, broad range of information and we'll provide pointers to additional leisure reading material for further study below. So the key takeaway here is that collecting and analyzing data from within our data center is a very different proposition than breaking down traffic on a single WAN link or looking at uh, aggregate traffic between locations. Yeah. Within a switch fabric, we're really looking to understand the broad patterns of flows with lower granularity, but broader visibility. Yeah, so we've talked about how we can use sampling to give us a very accurate picture of that traffic in aggregate. 
It's kind of like a Monet. Taking a step back, you get a clearer picture of the entire landscape. So if you haven't incorporated traffic flow sampling into your flow monitoring strategy, I want to encourage you to try this in your environment. So thanks, Kevin. And thanks to all of you for attending. As always, please share your experiences with the community of users in THWAC and let us know if this session was useful for you.